Welcome to the Business of Story, where we connect you with the leading minds in the art of business storytelling. Learn from best-selling authors, Hollywood screenwriters, makers, content marketers, and brand raconteurs on how to craft and tell compelling stories that sell. The Business of Story is brought to you by Emma, which provides innovative email marketing tools and services that drive brilliant results. And by Convince and Convert, digital marketing advisors and counselors to leading brands and organizations worldwide. Convince and Convert helps you gain and keep your customers online. Here's your host, Park Powell. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Business of Story and Happy New Year. I mean, what, 2017, it's here. I can't believe it. We've been doing the show now for a year and a half, kicking off July 1 of 2015, and uh, I think we're nearing 100 shows, 150-some thousand downloads. I just can't believe it. And I'm wondering if I could have even grown it faster if I was adhering to some goals, or maybe a little bit better goal setting. You know, we're all dealing with that this time of year, our New Year's resolutions, and everyone hits the gym and it lasts for a little while, and then it peters out come February and we're off to our old ways again. Well, with this as a story today, we have an extraordinarily special guest. I mean, the timing is perfect. Whether you are listening to us on January 1 of 2017 or July 1 of 2017 or December 31st of 2017, our guest today will be sharing with you ways, especially for the creative mind, to get your head around goal setting and get something in place that is really, truly going to work with you. She's an author of a couple of books. The book that I've been reading that my wife stole away from me last night and said, here, you can just give this to me for Christmas, is um, Start Right Where You Are. How Little Changes Can Make a Big Difference for Overwhelmed Procrastinators, check. Frustrated Overachievers, check. And recovering perfectionists. Well, I've never been a perfectionist, but I can use that better than anybody else to create resistance and procrastination in my life. So today we are very fortunate to have with us Samantha Bennett. She goes as Sam, as I understand, at least that's what she has on the cover of her book. And Sam, without further ado, because this year is already slipping away, we're practically into 2018. (laughs) Let's jump in. Welcome to Business of Story. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Yeah, that's everyone out there saying, hey, how's it going? (laughs) You've got a company called the Organized Artist Company. And when I went to it, organizedartistcompany.com, I thought, you know, there are so many goal-setting gurus in the world. What makes Sam different? And I guess I can really appreciate your difference found within your tagline. The Organized Artist Company dedicated to helping creative people who would like to be more organized that's moi, and organize people who would like to be more creative. I love that. Tell us a little bit more about your company and your mission behind it. Thank you. Yeah, I um, yeah, I created the Organized Artist Company uh, kind of inadvertently, <laughs> like, like so many things in my life. I sort of fell into it. Um, but I realized, you know, my background's in theater. Um, I was an actor. I was, one of the, I was an actor as a kid. I went to theater camp, you know, and I... Um, was with the second city in Chicago for a long time, did a lot of improv, some TV. And what I noticed in my life as, as an actor and an artist is there just isn't a right way, you know, there's just your way. And there were a lot of books and stuff out there about, you know, how to set goals and organize your time and be better with your money. And, you know, but creative people don't care who's moved our cheese. (laughs) that's that's not really our thing Um, and we're not getting up and going to the same place to work every day and we're responsible for promoting ourselves and when you can do anything what what should you do and there were a lot of books about creativity out there but they were a lot of you know unleashing your inner creative or spiritual healing through creativity and for those of us who are already plenty unleashed thank you very much um, you know how do we know How, how do we how do we know what to do so I just got really interested in that question. Yeah. And so my work is mostly, it's not like I've got some incredible system and everybody should do things my way. What I've got are some incredible mm, devices and ways for you to figure out what your amazing way is. What's your unique, indelible, wackadoodle way of doing things? And, and how can you lean into that a little bit more? 
And did you start, uh, from what you know best, it sounds like creativity from the improv side, where our, our creative minds tend to just swirl and swirl and we catch as catch can. And just by pure inertia and passion, we actually make things happen versus slowing down long enough to take a deep breath, let a little bit of that rational mind kick in and set our goals. I mean, is that the world you come from too? Um, some, some, and, and actually, I don't know, Park, I, I think our rational brain gets a little too much credit. <laughs> I, I think what I'd rather see people do is, is, is tune into that deep belly wisdom, you know, that intuition, that, that deep sort of calm knowing, uh, in my experience. Uh, the gut guru. Yeah. Gut guru. Yeah. I think that, that like, especially those ones where you're like, I don't know why I think this, but I sort of want to do this or like I can't really explain it like those are always super juicy Mm -hmm. you know today literally before this I was listening to Michael Hyatt's uh, webinar on the five uh, five days to your best year ever and it's really he's got a terrific program I don't know if you know Michael or not he was on business of story in June and I got to take him through the story cycle process it was fun but he talks of course a lot about passion and what drives you what gets you through the messy middle in story or in story well in stories yes but in goal mm. setting um, but you've got to have that got that passion that drives you through it now and yet his is a very very pragmatic approach to setting your your goals and and, you know, accomplishing those. Is yours similar to that? Or I know your book talks about 60 some different things that you could be doing right now. And to me, to the unorganized mind, that seems like they could even make it more unorganized. How do you pull that together and synthesize it for your readers? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a big fan of making things practical. I mean, my first book was called Get It Done from Procrastination to Creative Genius in 15 Minutes a Day. Like I'm, uh, I'm all about the making it real. Uh, and uh, and yeah, start right where you are is it's 66, but they're super tiny chapters. Some of those chapters, as you've seen, you know, they're just a page or two and each one has a little action step. So it's really meant to be very doable and very like do it right now. Mm-hmm. And the idea is, so some of them are little mindset tricks. Some of them are things you could actually do. But the idea is that by making little shifts, little changes, you can really um, change your whole trajectory. You know, just like a rocket ship, right? If, if, if you change the degree trajectory of a rocket ship, it's going to end up in someplace totally different. Um, and you can do that for yourself, too. Even just stuff like, like asking the question, how can I make this moment more me? How can I make this moment right now, right in this time right now, more me? This conversation, this, this doodle, this email, this, this outfit, this meal, this whatever it is you're doing right now. How could you just lean in just a little bit more, just show up just a little more fully and a little more authentically in this moment right now? Just one degree, not, you know, you don't have to let your whole freak flag fly, just one degree. So and, what does that look like? What Give us an example of how do you make it more me? I yeah, mean, so it's going to be different for, for everybody, you know, I mean, for some people, um, I mean, I think we've all had the experience of maybe being at the grocery store and just having like a moment with the cashier where... Like you'd say something funny or somebody makes an observation and it's like, oh, right, we're people. Like, hi, <laughs> nice to see you. Know, like you have the moment where you're just sort of real. Um, it might mean making more of a joke. It might mean being, you know, honoring a little bit more how shy you are. It, it'll, it'll look different for, for everyone. But, uh, but I think that that feeling that we sometimes have that our life is just zooming past us and we're just sort of functionaries doing things all day. You know, I hear this word overwhelm all the time from people who are just, we're doing and doing and doing and doing and doing, and yet still feeling like we're falling behind. So I think taking the moment to go, well, what, yeah, what is, what would make this a little more me? And, you know, maybe turning on, you know, turning on some music or I don't know, but we all know the feeling of feeling like it's not me, right? Like, oh, this is so not me or like, I'm not allowed to be me. Yeah. So, 20 years ago in doing my research, I noticed that um, your me, your you, is you had talked about being depressed, broke, exhausted, fed up with yourself. I mean, so what changed in the past, you know, two decades to get you to where you are today to showing people how to get out of that funk? Well, again, it was a lot of little tiny changes. I think the, the biggest mindset shift, though, was deciding to stop locating my happiness in the future. 
I had that feeling that I think a lot of us have of like, well, if, if this happens, you know, if I get this gig, or if I make this amount of money, or if I hit this goal weight, or when this happens, or that happens, like, then it'll be okay. And as I say, you know, as you pointed out, I'm a pretty goal oriented person. So sometimes I would hit those goals. And sometimes I wouldn't, but it didn't make any difference on the inside. So I moved mm -hmm. the focus of control from the outside into the insides into this moment right now, what can I be doing in this exact moment right now? which means inside of my own mind, which is the only thing I really have control over, and in the things that my hands can touch right now, what changes can I make to be maybe not happier? Happy can be a little bit of an overrated word, I think, but, mm -hmm. you know, calmer, mm -hmm. more joyful, more present, more alive, more gra more grateful, more, more, you know, more, more me, more something. So what were you going through back then and what was that aha moment that you knew you knew you had to change because it sounds like it completely altered your trajectory for what you do? Yeah, yeah. So like I said, I was an actor and um, I had one of those acting careers that always went well enough that you didn't want to give up on it, but not so well as to actually be able to support a person. <laughs> and yeah. it was and you frustrating. You were up in improv, Second City. Yeah. yeah what kind yeah. of acting were you doing? Um, a lot of a lot of comedy, a lot a lot of improv comedy, a lot of live theater in Los Angeles. I did a lot of radio plays with LA Theater Works, which meant I got to work with super famous people. Um, and then some television. You know, I was on the Drew Carey Show. I was on Days of Our Lives. I um, most I did an episode of Modern Family a while ago. Like I still work as an actor. I love it. Um, yeah. But and I, and I and I was so angry though because. I was working hard. I was following my bliss. I would send thank you notes. I would show up. I was working all the time. I stayed in touch with people. Like I, I was doing it right. You know, I was doing everything everybody told me to do and it still wasn't really working. It was financially disastrous and I just could never get any momentum going. And, and that's a really frustrating feeling when you're like, okay, how come I'm doing that? Everything's right. You know, I get called back and 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 it's between me and the other girl and the other girl gets it every single time. Really annoying. So again, I decided to start focusing more on that the thing, of the things that I could control. So f one thing that happened was on a days that I had an audition, I was very careful with myself. I would, um, you know, make sure I made it to the gym or got to take a walk. But I would, so I would, I would, I would, like not, I would not answer the phone actually before an audition. Like I didn't want to get pulled off in anybody else's drama. Um, and I would be really careful to make sure that I was really present in, in the room, both, you know, in the waiting room, connecting with my fellow actors and in the audition. And I know I'd schedule something really nice for afterwards. I would make sure that I had taken time for my prayer and meditation work. And then finally I was like, wait, why is this not every day? <laughs> like, <laughs> why am I treating this like a special occasion? Um, so that, uh, that started to tip it. And when I realized that, that me doing this, me, you know, going for a walk and taking time for my prayer and meditation and um, keeping my sense of humor and not getting pulled off into other people's drama. Like sometimes we think we, we can't do these things because it's selfish, right? Like I don't have time to take care of myself. That would be selfish. But it's actually the opposite of selfish. Because, you know, mm -hmm. you showing up exhausted and depressed and underfed and with no sense of humor, that's selfish because the rest of us have to deal with you like that. <laughs> and it's not that much fun. <laughs> But you know, when you show up, all, yeah, that's a very good point, right? But when you show up all calm and rested and present with that light in your eyes, like we love that. We love that version of you, and you're able to listen, and you have good ideas and a sense of humor, and you're not so reactive. And like that's, can you imagine if everybody did that? How does? Yeah, I mean, you are in the world of story and storytelling as an actress and all the different work you've you do. And of course, our listeners are all about story and how to use it in their lives and how to use it with their clients. How do you see uh, your work playing into helping a person change their story? You know, they may be living into a story that someone else has told them they needed to live into versus finding truly what their story is about and, and open, being open to that and making the little changes you're talking about. Yeah, I think, I think what you're on to your park is so important. I think the only thing that ever changed the world is a new story. Um. And the only thing that ever changed our lives is a new story. So to really be able to look critically at the stories that you're telling yourself, what are you believing about yourself? What are you believing about the world? What, and especially what's recurring, like those ones that like, oh, here I am again, over and over again, right? Same problem, different outfit. Like if you're getting that feeling, you can be pretty confident you are trapped in a story. 
which is great news because it means you have the power to change the story. You have the power to change the story. Yeah. Sam, are you by chance watching Westworld on HBO? You know, I watched the first couple of episodes and then it was just getting, turning into too big of a downer for me. <laughs> but I have them still on the DVR. Should I keep no. going? Yes, and it and it it was the same for us. Uh, you got to get through episode five, and even our son, who's over in Hollywood, he said, "Oh, Dad, you got to watch this. This is like the best show ever produced on TV, and it's all about story and the stories we tell ourselves." You know, mm. um, in Westworld, for those of you that aren't watching it, it is really where AI or artificial intelligence comes into play with the real world. But it's fascinating to me, and it, once you get into uh, Episode six, it really takes off. So it's, it's quite fascinating. But they talk about these story loops, and these are the loops that have been programmed into the hosts, which are really extraordinarily robots that look human, you know, in Westworld. Uh, but they are certainly a metaphor for all of us because these robots are trying to break out of this loop, and their AI is taking over, and they're starting to rationalize their existence. And what, what I love so much about it is this juxtaposition of while the guests are showing up, the paid human beings are showing up to live in this fantasy world, kind of live their alter ego or their shadow archetype, if you will, in one world that you know people don't allow them to live that way in the regular world. Here you've got these, uh, these uh, hosts, the uh, robots that are trying to create a new loop. And one funny thing was, is once I learned about your work and started reading your book, I was watching, I think we were in episode seven, and one of the primary hosts was talking about it's time to change my loop. And I just cracked up because I thought, that's Sam's book, is changing the loops that we tell ourselves, the stories that we are in. And you show us in what, 66 simple ways to change those loops. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and what it means is really, um, I think part of the reason it feels kind of weird is, you know, there's there, from from the neurological research that's that's going on. It, it seems like we have maybe between sixty and seventy thoughts a seventy thousand thoughts a day, which what exactly constitutes a thought and how you really measure that is completely up for debate. But um, but you know, the sort of best guess we're going with sixty to seventy thousand, and it seems like most of those thoughts are the exact same ones we had yesterday. And most of them are negative. Mm -hmm. Most of them are, are, are self-critical and critical of the world around us. So that tape is really loud and those grooves are really worn. And so that's, that's sort of one voice to contend with. And then there's all the conventional wisdom out there, right? Which conventional wisdom works for conventional people doing conventional things, that ain't us, kids. <laughs> like, that's not entrepreneurship. That's not creativity. <laughs> that's not that's not business. Um, you know, it's good for like, should you change the oil in your car? Yes, that's a conventional thing. You should follow conventional wisdom on that. Um, but how do you grow a podcast? How do you lead a fulfilling life? How do you become a great parent or a great partner? There's no the way on that. So you've got to start to ignore those tapes that have been running in your head for so long and ignore that conventional wisdom and really start to pay attention to that tiny, tiny voice inside you, that little bit of intuition that can get you to what I like to call the sparkly breadcrumb stage, right? <laughs> sparkly breadcrumbs. So you have a little thought and you go, you like sort of check it out, like, oh, I'm sort of interested in this or what if happens if this or I kind of want to call that person. And then you see how it goes. You see how it goes. You know, pay attention to those first couple of steps and how you feel. Yeah, pay mm -hmm. attention to those first couple of steps because sometimes, you know, you have a little idea, you see a sparkly breadcrumb, you make a couple of moves, but, you know, it's a lot of missed communication. It's a lot of knees and elbows. You're not feeling great about it. It's like, okay, now's not the right time for that. Not never, but not right now. On the other hand, yeah, sometimes so you're following your gut again. Right, right, right. And other times, and I know you've had this experience where like you take a couple of little steps and it's like, whoosh, you know, the universe just comes rushing at you with all kinds of crazy support. It's beautiful. Yeah, isn't that true? Well, you had mentioned earlier about following your bliss. And as our good friend Joseph Campbell, America's foremost mythologist, said, you follow your bliss and doors will open where there were only walls before. And that's the thing. You start following this stuff. The universe opens up and people show up in your life like you have for us with Business of Story and other people out there um, that just kind of help you get to where you need to go. But you got to really trust it, don't you? Exactly. Exactly. 
So in your book, 66, now there must be three or four that rise to the top for you that seem like they really have helped you or they're helpful for your readers. Can you give us a few of your tips in here? Sure, sure. And you're right, there's a ton. And so it does feel a little like picking my favorite child, but I do have a favorite. (laughs) Um, I think my favorite and and one of the most useful, talking about making little changes in the the moment, um, is... Uh, this is a, a strategy that's particularly good if you're stuck. If you're stuck emotionally, stuck in a story, stuck in some old experience, um, and in the you know, like oh, like like when you're mad and you know you shouldn't be mad, but you are mad, <laughs> or you're grief stricken, something like that. Mm-hmm. And here's the tip: make some five minute art about it. Make some five minute art about the feelings that you're having which means you can draw how it feels, you can make up a song, you can do a little dance, you could get out your Sculpey clay, like whatever, it, however it is you like to self-express. And it can be really crappy, like nobody ever has to see it. We're just trying to get the feelings out into the world in some form. Because here's what happens. Two things happen. One, feelings just want to be felt. Feelings just want to be felt. And once a feeling knows it's been felt, it can get promoted and get a better job as opposed to trying to keep feelings locked away, right? Because that works so well. (laughs) So uh, Mm -hmm. when you let your feelings have form, then they know they've been felt. But also once it's out of your head a little bit, you can start to get some perspective on it. You can, you can start to interact with it in a different way. Um, I remember I had one client who did it and she, she ended up drawing this huge black bird that like covered the whole page. And she said, you know, I had no idea how angry I was. Like I didn't like she didn't even know how angry she was until she saw her own drawing. I was like, "Ooh, I got some feelings that need to be dealt with here." Like, good, good information, good intel. I had a, a woman who was interviewing me recently, and she she read the book. She got to the part about the five minute make some five minute art, and like all of us, kind of went like, "Oh, that's a good idea. I should do that sometime. <laughs> I should do that sometime. That would be great." The next day, because she still has her day job, she had a horrible day at work. Horrible. She came home. She was really upset saw my book and went, oh, now would be a good time to make some five-minute art about it because I'm super upset. So she made a drawing of herself at work and it was her kneeling in the center and everybody around her throwing rocks at her. That's how she had been feeling, (laughs) right? So great insight there into how she was feeling. Then she was inspired to do a second drawing of her still kneeling and everybody still throwing rocks, but with an invisible shield around her. And she said the shield was the love of God. So she was able to go into work the next day with a totally different mindset, a totally different way of being, because she knew she was protected by the love of God. Wow. Now, I mean, it's hard to get to that, especially when you are under fire, having a bunch of people around you throwing rocks at you. At least that's the way it gets manifest in your illustration. How do you overcome that? It's one thing to talk about doing it, but is, are there some tips or techniques to get you there? Because it, for me anyways, it's so hard to shut off that angry tape going on. Right. Well, that's it. You lean into the tape. I mean, so you got to pattern interrupt enough to know that you're in it, okay. right? To so like, wow, here I am really having these strong feelings yeah. or here I'm really trapped. And they go, okay, this is the moment. This is the moment. The more And the stronger your feelings are, the more you should make some art and just get it out there. Just get the feeling out there. Um, I had one woman in a, in a live workshop I was doing raise her hand and she was like, Sam, I, I hear you say this thing about make some art about it. And, and I don't really know what you mean, which I was so pleased that mm-hmm. she asked the question. Cause that's a terrible feeling, right? That feeling of like, everybody here is understanding something that I am not understanding. Right. Uh, that could really ruin your day. But instead she asked and I said, great, great, great. I said, so if you were going to make up a little song about how it feels to not know what I mean, how would that go? And she goes, I don't get it. 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 <laughs> and then she goes, Oh, I get it. <laughs> I sing that every day. <laughs> right? And then I sing this song to myself all the time. I sing that song every single day. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's great. And that's the th- that's part of it too, is when you give your feelings form like that, you can start to share them with other people. And everybody else, you know, we've all had that feeling and we can all relate to that feeling and and to really and the art that you make about your anger and your heartbreak and your loneliness. That's what helps me with my anger and my heartbreak and my loneliness. And it comes down to, I think, 
as well as really getting your own story straight and owning it. Like you said, lean into it. I guess that, that I use that term a lot of about owning it. About you know, mm-hmm. it's warts and all. Um, what is your story truly about? So I was going through this, and I was I was flipping through your book, and one chapter keeps coming up time and time again for me. It's it's chapter forty six. Consider future costs, not sunk costs. And I think I trip over this a lot. I'm like, oh, my God, I got all this money into this, and oh, did I just waste all of this? Can you take us through that a little bit? Because you're going to really help me, and in doing so, I hope you help my listeners. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's sunk costs is something that like economists just throw their heads into their hands when they try to explain it to us normal people, <laughs> because it doesn't really make intuitive mm-hmm. sense. But the idea is that when you have invested in something, well, I'll back, let me back up one more step. What really happens is we hate to be wrong. We love to be right and we hate to be wrong. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So when we do something like invest a lot of money in something, so let's say I buy a yellow coat for $300 and that doesn't really fit. And every time I look at it, I'm like, oh God, there's that coat and I spend so much money and I don't wear it, but you know, maybe it'll, maybe (laughs) something, you know, (laughs) it's like, no, no, the ship has sailed, right? The $300 has been spent. I am not getting it back. Game over on the 300 bucks. Let the coat go. Let the right. coat go to fulfill its destiny of being a coat on somebody who looks good in yellow. Like, <laughs> let the thing go. And this idea that because we've invested a lot of money in something or a lot of time in something or a lot of relationship in something is not necessarily a reason to keep it going. Right? So just because we've been married for 25 years doesn't necessarily mean we should stay married. And the way to think about this is to ask yourself the question, knowing what I know now, would I make the same decision again? Knowing what I know Mm -hmm. now, would I make the same decision again? So here I am, I've invested all this money in this podcast and all this time and all this work and I have all this equipment and I really put my reputation on the line. But knowing what I know now, would I do it again? And if the answer is yes, then you're good right? You are on the right track. And if the answer is no, then pull the plug, pull the plug. So if I'm itching to bring this interview to a close right now and say, okay, that's it. I'm done. Then I got to pull the plug. But in actuality, I have just absolutely loved this. Someone asked me the other day, man, you do a lot of those podcasts, you know, what's in it, you know, what's in it for you. And I go, well, first and foremost, it's meeting people like you, Sam, having these incredible people on the show that I get coached by every time I have an interview. And I said, it has just completely opened up my world. And then they go, oh yeah, but you know, is it really left? Can you really point to business you've gotten off of it? And I go, well, you know, yeah, in some areas I can, but that's not why I do it. It's just something that is fulfilling this creative need in me for understanding why story works in our lives. And so I explore it from every standpoint, from you know producers, writers, directors, to content marketers, to folks like you that are in the creative profession, and but they are working with others and helping them get their story straight. So I guess, you know, I do have a lot of sunk cost into this, but now I have a, a good appreciation of what you're talking about with that, is once you're into it, go for it. If it's not working for you, and if you go back to that gut feeling, I suppose, um, pull the plug. Move on. Move on to the next thing. And I guess that that leads me to my next question for you, Sam, is especially in the creative world where so much is swirling around. Now, we have, my wife, Michelle, and I have raised a very creative family. It's just the way it happened. She, my wife, is an interior designer. And she is a collector, so she is like a whirling dervish that has a hard time, admittedly, you know, putting one step foot in front of the next because she has so much on her plate, that overwhelmed side. Our daughter, the oldest of our kids, is an event designer in San Diego. Our middle son, our middle kid, our son is a motion graphics artist in Hollywood. And our youngest son is an aspiring digital music maker uh, and DJ. So we're all about this. But I think the one thing that we all have across the board is this whirling dervish mentality that feels bad sometimes, like, oh, we got to get our act together and get this done. Um, And I feel like in your book that you answer a lot of those questions. So how can you give us creative folks all permission to just accept the way we go about this and then, you know, continue to help help us find our and set our goals so we can be successful in this whirling dervish life we lead? Yeah. I, I, well, first of all, congratulations on having such a beautiful family. Yay. <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's a... Amazing. Yeah, we have a blast. 
I bet. I bet. Um, I think the real thing to look at is your results. You know, if you're getting the results in your life that you want, you know, if you're having fruitful relationships, if you feel great about the, the work you're creating, if your financial situation is at least, you know, manageable, then you're fine. And who cares how you go about it? You know, I love to wake up at four in the morning and write. It's a beautiful time of day to write. Um, you know, I love to have, I don't know, three to five kind of big projects going at the same time. Um, you know, there's this conventional wisdom that says, you know, well, you should just focus on one thing. You know, focus, that's how you get successful is focus on one thing. I think that people who like to focus on one thing should focus on one thing. And those of us who like to focus on three to five things should focus on three to five things. Like, like Look at what works mm -hmm. for you. You know, for me, a ton of planning doesn't really help. I'm much more like, let's just jump off the building and build the parachute on the way down. I'm sure it'll be fine. You know? <laughs> Uh, and that's what works yeah. for me. But that's what works for me. I wouldn't recommend that anybody else do that. Other people, they really, they, it works for them to plan. It works for them to have a timeline. It works for them to really go everything, go over everything with a fine tooth comb. That's great. You know, so looking at what is your natural style, and this is a lot of what the organized artist company is all about, is pointing out to creative people that you're already organized. You already have a system. You know, some people come home, they drop their keys, and then they spend 20 minutes the next morning looking for their keys. That's a system. That's an organizational system. It's not a good organizational system, but it's an organizational system. And if it works for you, then great. You know? Um, so looking at the, and if there are parts of your life that aren't working as well as you would like them to, to look at the parts that are working and say, okay, how can I transfer some of the ways in which I make this thing work and make this thing that's not working more like that other thing? So if you like to have things be different all the time, then have things be, you know, when you're having trouble with your nutrition, like, remember that you're going to want a lot of variety in your nutrition. Um, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes to this, this whirling dervish thing, this having a lot of projects, let me just say this. Sometimes completion is overrated. Like, not everything has to get finished. So you could, right. you, yeah, you know, you can just, I mean, you can just drop it. You're allowed right. to just drop it. <laughs> Well, and that's why I like what I like so much about your book. Start right where you are. You know, don't overthink this thing. Accept who you are, the story you're in, and then get get after it. What I'd like to do is take a break right now, so our sponsors can share a story. And when we come back, Sam, I want to cover these three areas very quickly: of the overwhelmed procrastinator, the frustrated overachiever, and the recovering perfectionist. And if you've got one or two tips in each one of those areas for our listeners that they could apply immediately in their lives. So let's do that right after these messages. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful. So go to definitivedigest.com and subscribe for free right now. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call to action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click, The Psychology Behind a Great Call to Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns, and to help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. You, like all business leaders and communicators, have an important brand story to tell, but it's probably not being heard. There's just too much competition for our attention, unless, of course, you tell a better story. For over a year now, I have connected you with more than 50 international story artists through this podcast to help you craft your ideal brand story for the growth of your enterprise and your people. 
Did you know I'm also available to you for speaking engagements, brand and leadership story workshops, even for one-on-one Skype or telephone brand story strategy consults? Plus, you can begin clarifying your brand story right now by downloading the interactive DIY workbook at businessofstory.com. You see, your sales don't have to be comedies or tragedies. You can make them epic by clarifying your brand story and connecting with audiences and customers like never before. So download your workbook today at businessofstory.com. And if you're not 100% satisfied, I'll happily refund your money. And one last thought. Just remember the most potent story you ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a good one, my friends. Story on. Hey, welcome back to Business of Story. And our guest today, Sam Bennett, author of Start Right Where You Are. Um, Also, it's her second book. She also wrote Get It Done. She has an amazing company called The Organized Artist Company. And I love this tagline, dedicated to helping creative people who would like to be more organized and organized people who would like to be more creative. So uh, definitely fall into that creative person liking to be more organized. And I just found your book a real gift when it was sent to me earlier this um, this month. And like I said, I was reading it last night in preparation for this, and my wife Michelle drug it out of my hands and said, okay, you can give this to me for Christmas once you're done with it. So great, it's, it's going to be a big hit for our family. Um, we started at the beginning of the show, Sam, I was talking about, you know, there are a lot of folks that do goal setting and help people get their acts together and so forth. So you, like the rest of us, are a commodity in this world unless we really get our brand story straight. And I think you've done a beautiful job of doing that. So would you do me the honor if I take you through a lightning round of the story cycle process and show how your either both your personal brand and your professional brand come together to separate you out in your own beautiful way in this world of, of goal setting consultants and, and organizers and so forth. You, are you game for that? I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. And tell your wife, I'm so flattered. I can't imagine anything nicer than somebody wanting my book as a Christmas present. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> wanting it. She grabbed it out of my hand. So here, hey, you, you got to give this to me. So it's great. All right. So here we go. Um, we're going to start. I'm going to take you through the 10 steps. And this is all about getting your brand story straight to really owning it. So let's start with number one. The first question is, Sam, what do you do better than anybody else? Uh, I'm good at seeing patterns and systems uh, and I'm and I'm good with language, patterns, systems, and language. So that certainly plays to that artist in you as well, actress, the improv side, seeing the pattern, systems, mm-hmm. and language to make that happen. All right. So we've got that as our backstory. Number two is our audiences, and the question is, who cares? Who cares about that? What you are good at. Well, what I what came to my mind when I heard you ask that is is you know sometimes my work is just me standing on stage, you know, speaking to a room full of people and saying, "Hey, guess what? Your creativity matters." Um, at which point they burst into tears because nobody ever said that to them before. So anybody who who doubts mm-hmm. or questions, you know, their their own uh, creative genius. Beautiful. And what is it that they want? So what's at stake in their story? Yeah, they want to do their good work in the world. They want to not leave this world with their work undone. And why do they want that? Uh, Significance, feelings of significance, feelings of... um, I, th- I think sometimes creative feel like creative people feel like we're the translators of the world or the the bridge builders. Uh, you know, art explains our feelings to mm-hmm. us. So the more the more that work can be done, the more connected we become, the the the, the healthier and more whole we become. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that significance. I think that makes a lot of sense. That creativity is a language in its own right, and it's a language that is uniquely our own, depending on how we choose to express it. So I could see um, that that would be, you know, a, a real big why do they want it? Then my next question is, why don't they already have it? Uh, there's just an enormous amount of self doubt, perfectionism. Um, I think school teaches us that there's a right way. You know that you're supposed to know the answers in advance. Because that's how you succeed in school is knowing the answers in advance. Um, sometimes even knowing the questions in advance. But 
you may have noticed life is not like that. <laughs> Creativity is not like that. Parenthood isn't like that. Nothing's mm-hmm. like that. Right. So um, a lack of self-trust. So self-doubt, lack of self-trust, they haven't been given permission um, from folks around them to do it. So this is chapter five of the story cycle process of really uh, getting real on what the obstacles and the antagonists are. And in this case with creativity, so much of it is about that internal voice, you know, that internal antagonist that tells us we're not good enough, sharp enough, fast enough, whatever. Now, in your line of work with the Organized Artist Company and, the, and just your back story getting up to this stage, we move into the mentor, and that is you, the mentor guide. How are you equipped to help the people that you help? Well, having a good sense of humor helps. <laughs> it's a lot easier to help people when they're laughing. <laughs> so I think that that has gone a long way. Certainly a lifetime in the theater, uh, and particularly in improvisation, has has prepared me really well for entrepreneurship. Um you know, when you set an opening date, your show opens on that date. You know, it doesn't matter if the website's not done. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter if, you know, you're, this person doesn't know their lines. It doesn't matter. You know, you're just going to do it. So um, I think it gave me a tremendous amount of stamina. I think I have a lot of stamina um, and a lot of – and a good balance between being super determined and focused and also kind of relaxed and understanding that things have their own time and you kind of got to go with the flow sometimes. Yeah. All right, so we move into Chapter 7. So how do you help them? This is the road of trials. We know how you're equipped to do it, so what is it that you physically do to help them? Uh, Often all I do is listen as carefully as I can and repeat back to them what I hear them saying. People always have their own answers, uh, but sometimes, you know, I'm a verbal processor myself. I often don't know that I've thought something until I've said it out loud, and sometimes I don't know that I've said it out loud until somebody says it back to me. Uh, so sometimes that's that's a lot of what I do. I give voice mm-hmm. to those those inner inner critics and inner doubters, uh, and let them interact with those things in a, in a new way using imagination games, worksheets, questions. And so, yeah, let's take that even a little bit deeper. How can people work with you? So, is this online, in person, through your books, workbooks? I mean, um, that all is still a part of that chapter seven of that road of trials. This is where brands really get to talk about their features and benefits. Yeah, probably the quickest way is to go to, if you go to startrightwhereyouare.com, uh, there's a little free opt in there that's the Procrastination Domination Starter Kit. And it's two of my most powerful exercises. Uh, one is a sort of a deciding decision making, so you can choose between your 137 great ideas. And the other one has to do with dealing with compliments and criticisms, whether they're coming from outside your head or inside your head. Um, so that's free, and that gets you on my email list, which is mostly how I communicate with people. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah, that's probably that's probably your best bet is to get on my email list in that way. Okay. Now, um, in our last three chapters that starts with, this is where we're kind of moving into Act 3. What does success look like for your customers, your audiences, the people you help? What does it physically look like? It looks like movement, right? So it's either getting an idea from the inside of your head to the outside of your head or getting it outside the house or getting it to, to someplace where it can make money for you. A lot of I work with a lot of creative entrepreneurs. Um, it looks like greater clarity and confidence, uh, and mm, I'm torn between using the words peacefulness or contentment. Like, the, but there's something very solid, you know, feeling feeling very solid in what they're doing mm-hmm. and who they are. Well, that leads me to my next question: What does success feel like? Yeah, well, maybe, it, maybe you just answered that. Yeah, a little. It feels like that. That. Um, it feels like joyful experimentation. It feels like uh, trust. It feels like uh, ownership, o- owning who you are and what you do. Wow, great. And then the final question in this that takes us to Chapter 10 of the Story Cycle is, how do you keep them coming back for more? I mean, how do they create a ritual out of what you teach them? Well, the ritual I that my... One of the big ones I, 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 I thump on a lot is 15 minutes a day. Spend 15 minutes a day on the projects that matter most to you. 15 minutes a day, every single day, before you check your email, 
before you check your email, before you check your email, spend 15 minutes on the projects that matter most to you. Um, <laughs> and so I have a, I have a little membership slate called the 365 club and people get a daily email. They get a little daily prompt and there's a Facebook page and I do an open Q and a call once a month. Um, and that's available to anybody who takes, I, I offer courses and stuff online um, throughout the year. And then, and that's almost always a bonus. So people can sort of stay in touch with me. And mm -hmm. luckily um, personal development isn't something that like, once you like you ever like learn it and are done, you know, like, yeah, I got that dialed. <laughs> so people will yeah. often stay with me for many, many years. Right. right. <laughs> well, great. I mean, what I see and hear in your brand and, per, you know, brand story is really how you can put your creative mind to work for you. Um, and even if you've thought you, you know, you, you don't really appreciate yourself as a creative individual, it's really there to give yourself permission to explore that and go and have some fun with it. And if you are that uh, wild and crazy creative mind, how can you use that best to, to be productive and keep moving forward without killing your creativity in the process? So, love to wrap up the show with these three areas that we talked about. Can you give us one tip for me, the overwhelmed procrastinator? Because I can tell you I've got 50 things that I put on my plate and I get so overwhelmed, I don't get any of them done. What could I do to overcome that that uh, character flaw inside me? Yeah, well, first of all, I would I remember that overwhelm is a choice. Overwhelm is a choice, and it, 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 it's a feeling that comes upon us when we can't decide what's important, when everything feels like it's coming at us with the same level of importance. That's when we start to feel overwhelmed. So to stay connected to your priorities, to stay connected to the things that have the most leverage, you know, that if you do them, they, have, they bring the biggest results, um, to the things that light you up the most, that bring you the most joy and, and happiness uh, and, and, and feeling of, of being creatively fulfilled. Lean into those things first and and be willing to say no to things. You know, selective neglect is an important skill set. Selective neglect. I've got to remember that. That's going on my mantle for 2017. So next up, the frustrated overachiever. And again, I could probably fall into this category as well as a lot of our listeners. We're trying to do a lot of things. We're out there in the solopreneur world, or we've got a startup going, or we've got a business that's going great, and we're trying to take it to the next level. But we are just like just too many things again that overwhelm, but we're a, sol a frustrated overachiever. What can we do? Yeah. Uh, get a C. Get a C. Quit trying to get an A plus and everything. Just get a C. C is the grade that you get for showing up and doing the work. Show up, do the work. Show up, do the work. Show up, do the work. Not doing the work better than anybody else. Not doing extra credit work. Just show up, do the work. Because here's and I can hear like the perfectionist like bursting into hives. Like it's like I can let me just say that first of all, this works because your version of a C is pretty much everybody else's version of an A to begin with. You may have noticed that already. And second of all, if you get it out there and then it needs to be made more perfect, then you'll make it more perfect because that's how you roll. But get it out there so that people can start to interact with you and it, whatever it is. Whatever it is. And now you're moving into the recovering perfectionists. What do we do to overcome that? How do we recover? Yeah, I think um, – the phrase that I find most helpful with that is is the phrase, uh, I talk about this a lot in the book, is nothing bad is happening. Nothing bad is happening. And when I remember that phrase, I say it a lot, my team says it a lot to me, <laughs> nothing bad is happening. Uh, it reminds me of a couple of things. One is just my overall belief in a benevolent universe. Like if I'm going to believe that this is a kind and benevolent or at least indifferent place, like that, that maybe nothing bad is happening. It also permits me to get a little more precise in my language. Like if nothing bad is happening, what is happening? Is something uncomfortable happening? Something challenging? Something painful? Something um, sad? Or just something that isn't the way I would have done it? <laughs> like I wouldn't have done it that way something? Uh, and really, um, and also not freaking out about things that aren't happening at all, right? So nothing bad is happening. Nothing bad is happening. Well, it's been all good today on the show. Where can people learn more about you and your amazing work? 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, startrightwhereyouare.com is uh, a great place to start. There's a bunch of freebies and stuff on there. Uh, you can also come look at the organizedartistcompany.com, all the way spelled out, because I'm a spell it all out for you kind of a girl, the organizedartistcompany.com. And uh, yeah, and like I said, hop into whatever freebies up there. That'll get you on my email list. And then you can write me back and tell me about your projects and we'll be best friends and pen pals. It'll be great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for coming into my world for 2017. I mean, timing is absolutely perfect, and I appreciate you kicking off the new year with us. I should be playing Old Ang Syne or something like that, but I don't have it queued up. But Sam, thank you so much for being on Business of, Business of Story. Thank you so much for having me, Park. Nice to talk to you. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in again today to Business of Story and really the happiest of New Year's. 2017 is going to be amazing. You're going to get out there. You are going to live into your most powerful story. I just know it. I'm here to help you wherever I can. Visit me at businessofstory.com. I have a ton of materials, not only this podcast, but blog content and lots of tools for you to use. And coming soon will be an online course where you can start putting the story cycle to work for you to help you really understand and live into and prosper from your most potent stories. So thank you for listening. Join us next week when we will have another amazing story artist on the business of story. And until then, have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Emma and by Convince and Convert and is produced by Convince and Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts. Podcast Imaging by Audio Bag.